Welcome to the DNA Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Pugh, and join with me as always is my big, my lovable, my personal Hodor, Kevin Sir Bobbins. Hi. Kev, how are you doing tonight? I'm well. Are you? I got, uh, yeah, I got in the basement, do a little woodworking. Did you know? I'm making a shield for Thomas in our okay. vampire game. Okay. And, and uh, you did yeah. some art earlier, too. You were making are we easels. Easels. You were making yeah. easels. They look terrible. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. By design. All right. All right. Well, we're not here to talk about vampires tonight. We're not here to talk about art. Uh, we are here to talk about one of my favorite things. We're here to talk about dinosaurs. And we cannot do a dinosaur episode without our good friends, uh, Dr. Brian Curtis from Fossil Crates, as well as our new compatriot. Well, he's not new. He's been on the show before, but I feel like I can't do a dinosaur episode now without these two. You guys are like a dynamic duo. Uh, oh. We have Zach here from DinosaurTrips.com. Uh, Zach, Dr. Brian Curtis, welcome to the show, guys. Uh, how are you guys doing? Outstanding. Thank you for having me back. Wonderful to be back. And likewise, doing great and uh, thrilled to be back on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, so the last time we had you guys in the show, uh, you were getting ready to go out to uh, Alberta and you were getting ready to do a uh, your dinet your what was it your first trip official trip was our first trip yeah how did that go Alberta it was fantastic it was two weeks exploring right across the province um, honestly like first trip. Couldn't have gone better for our mm. experience. The guests had a really fantastic time. Uh, you know, we had uh, a number uh, of guests with us from the U.S., so I think there was a lot of surprise that Alberta has a real cowboy culture to it. Uh, the Calgary Stampede happened to be going on at, this, at basically the same time we were in the province, and that's uh, a lot of people, I think, don't know about the Calgary Stampede. Canadians do. It's a, it's called the greatest outdoor show on earth. It's chuck wagon races. It's bucking Broncos. It's the whole thing, and it takes over the whole city. But, you know, that vibe really exists throughout the whole province. Um, so, you know, in addition to going to Drumheller and the Royal Tyrrell Museum, and getting some incredible access there we had dinosaur provincial park just blew my mind i mean mm. we, we, that was two fantastic days uh, and then we we're up in northern alberta uh, before the end of the trip up in grand prairie and wembley at the philip j curry dinosaur museum up there and we were we you know we took part in a multiple day dig on that and uh for somebody like myself who's just been a paleo hobbyist my whole life um the idea of ever getting to go on a dig seemed impossible so when we, when we actually got to do it uh we were out there you know and you're scraping away and you're hitting you're hitting fossil bone uh and then you're going you're taking it back to the the lab the next day and scraping it off i mean it was just it, it was dream come true to be honest with you and then we finished strong we were doing the horseback riding in the rocky mountains we went deep caving so real adventure stuff like i think mm. a few of the guests were like oh man we're so we're serious with this uh going deep and, and crawling through caves but it was spectacular <laughs> it, was a, it was a great two weeks the weather was really on our side throughout the whole adventure as well so uh, yeah i mean that that set the table for everything that we're doing this year of, uh, okay, this is, this is not just viable. This is an, an extremely good time, uh, with some like-minded people, you know, obviously, um, maybe in certain circles and Brian's circles, he gets to talk with fellow paleo enthusiasts all the time. Uh, it's harder to find out in the real world. Uh, so it was great to just spend a couple of weeks with some folks who really, who some of them, you know, care deeply and were, were obsessed of the nerdiest variety of dino fan. Others were along for the ride. And, uh, but I think we really opened the doors to paleontology and uh, just the thrill of museums. And, and if not even that, the thrill of, of doing a dinosaur dig, uh, there's nobody who, who doesn't, walk away from that being like oh man that's one off the list that i can really tell everybody about so that was amazing excited to do it again we're doing it again this summer as well so that's yeah that's awesome we and like we have a, a couple events that we're going to talk about and as you can see behind for those who are looking at our our video side you can actually see uh dr brian curtis has already put up for display and we're going to get into those um so but i do want to know this i'm curious uh what was one of your most memorable moments from this and then follow up from this event, what uh, actually, uh, sorry about that, my phone just went off. Uh, my follow up with it is, uh, you know, what from this experience did you utilize to set up and maybe change for the next experience? Well, to answer the first one, the highlight yeah. was... Uh... I mean, I think it's the dig if I, if I, you know, frankly, but the, the bigger surprise, uh, 
highlight, I think. You know, I knew the dig was coming. I knew we were doing it with Dr. Curry. So, you know, the, it met expectation, certainly. But uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park, I, I didn't have a great idea of what to expect. You know, I knew I'd, I'd read about it. I'd done my research. I'd talked with folks. But until you get there and you're walking around in the Alberta Badlands, and they're gorgeous on their own, like that kind of that kind of took my breath away. Uh, but then just the, the what we were finding, um, you know, some of the we, – we found one that we we call, you know, the, amongst the, the group that was out there traveling, we nicknamed it the Flintstone Bone just because it was so, like – almost a cartoon kind of find it had like you know it, it was completely formed it had the knobs on the end and you're just like oh man it looks wow. like it belongs in, in uh pebbles hair rather than and <laughs> you know and, and and from from the per as the person who organized the trip the highlight mm. for me was when one guest came to me after the day in dinosaur provincial park and said that wasn't real right like they set that up for us like we didn't stumble we didn't find that <laughs> ourselves and i was like i'm pretty sure we did man like i don't think they're i don't think these are pro i mean he knew that he didn't mean are they real bones but you know yeah, i yeah, think yeah. he was asking are they or he was asking like are they taking us to where they this is kind of well we're we'll pretend that we're out there ambling around and we stumble upon it but no i mean the park is just thick with with fossils to the point that you make a pretty legitimate find on your little hike and they're and one guest is concerned like shouldn't we excavate further here and they're like not here we don't have the time or the resources to go into everything that you know in some places that would get great attention in dinosaur provincial park it's like well yeah we'll we'll probably never even get to that one but good fine kind of thing it's just so <laughs> so, so that was a highlight for me just the mind-blowing nature of, of of stumbling upon fossils out there and they nice. have great guides they did a great job with it with it um the park folks there so yeah i'd say that was the highlight and and for me that's what informed the next trip you know is what can we deliver that is going to make the the guests go wait a second really like actually and then and the more times we can get the, the guests to have that experience as as dr curtis has taken us you know behind the scenes or just explaining to us what it is that we're witnessing the, those moments for the folks are just like oh I, I had a certain expectation and now that's just been blown out of the water of what we're getting to do so the, you know that that was as we were as, as brian and i were talking about what we would include on these trips to the southern u.s uh, this may um you know kind of First and foremost is how do we just how, how do we make everybody go oh wow can't believe it didn't expect that that kind of thing. Nice. So uh, follow up question for you, Brian. You talking about like the plethora of fossils? Is that like a good problem to have? Like where you you're just there's too much work for you to do. It's a problem, and you know it, it is good in the sense that there's lots to to there's lots it's a target rich environment, but it is bad because you have a limited resource of time and plaster and storage back at the facility. So it is, it's tough. And when you mix it in with the whole commercial fossilization and their argument that the scientists are letting these things get destroyed because they can't collect them all in timely fashion, they make a good point when it comes to places like Provincial Park because the, the bounty is so epic. And we have 500 Triceratops skulls in collections. Do you need another one? Not that you're getting Triceratops right where you are at, but the, the the conundrum is when you're in a place like Dinosaur Provincial Park, if it doesn't have the skull with the neck bones all are all articulated with skin impressions, you're you're not as apt to collect it. So it's it's a it's a challenge. We've run across this in the United States at Dinosaur National Monument, and they built a wall, they built a roof over it, and said we're just going to leave it like this. A few places have tried that. But even then, it's problematic. You've got to maintain a facility. So it's a beautiful, as a paleontologist, I love it. I'm walking around all day and I'm picking out, well, which one do I want to take? But that means the ones I leave behind, you can't stop the weather and the winter's coming. You can't stop the clock and winter is coming, Hodor. And as a result, <laughs> when it arrives, these bones are going to be frozen and the water's going yeah. to get in. And then the expansion and contraction and ultimately, in but a few years' time, these bones are going to disintegrate or at least lose their great shape. So it is it is a really rough problem to have, especially in Alberta. Uh, I've been there. And my mind was blown. I walked around. We have a similar problem. It's, it's in the petrified forest. And we'll be visiting that on these trips. And it has 
Triassic specimens all over the place, but it's a similar problem and not as articulated, but what do you choose to save as a scientist? And me, I'm going to save certain taxa because I study them. So then you get a problem of, well, now it's it's not a true collection of everything. It's You have sample bias. So then when you go and run these faunal analyses, all the meat eaters get picked up every time. The more complete animals get collected and the scrappy ones that might be new taxa or smaller taxa get ignored. So the long-winded answer is, that the short version is it's a wonderful problem to have i would take that every single day over my field work in africa where i walk day after day after day and other than dodging death from animals and people i didn't find but you know a, a literally a thumbnail sized piece of bone and i was elated you'd have thought that i'd won the lottery so i don't like that in comparison to finding skeleton skeletal remains everywhere i get that i think part of me like what I'm going through in my head is if if I was in your profession, I would be constantly wondering, did I skip over something significant? And it would destroy me ever I would I would never sleep. Like I, I can only imagine that is something that you guys have that problem with. Did did I wrap that correctly? Did that properly preserved? Did, did I tag the right thing? Did I skip something? Man, I should have picked up that thigh bone that I saw earlier. You know, was that vertebrae worth keeping? Oh, like I, I I'm not even yeah. doing this job, and I'm having all the like the anxiety in my head right now. Uh, FOMO, because then uh, it, oh, what, when you wake up in the morning and you're surrounded by bones, you have to make a decision. You can only go one direction. You can only go. You know, you, you've got to go pick a spot to go excavate or at least scout. And then do you stop? Do you flag this one with your GPS? Because you have to map it. You mm. got to find out where it's all at. Or do you think there's going to be something better? So it's it's the, when do you just call it a day and say, all right, I'm collecting my chips. I'm going to sit on this bone and pull this one out of the ground. So what ends up happening is the team has a mission ahead of time. We're looking to find X. And that's what we're after, a search image. Or we're going to say, we're going to take this gridded off area and we're taking everything for a faunal analysis. So the research questions drive a lot of the collecting activity that's going on. I've been in projects where I wept internally saying, why am I not collecting this? But it's because we're looking. Our grant is specifically trying to find taxon X. And we have a lot of that other taxon, even though it looks pretty nice. Now, of course, what you do is you text your buddy and say, hey, there's this <laughs> over here. Uh, can you go get a permit and come jump on this or add to our permit and bring your resources? And that's where graduate students come in because they can do all that grunt work and you can keep looking. <laughs> I love it. So tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, the, the upcoming events that you guys have coming on, uh, the one in Arizona and California, the one that is in Utah and Colorado, both of which legitimately jealous and excited for, uh, as well as we have some fun. I, I I love that there's always something new and fun in paleontology, which seems very it seems very odd and something that is from the past. You 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 think that, hey, how much more can we really learn? Or how much more new information is there? And yet in the last couple months, since January, the beginning of January, I, I have not only one, but three big of like big fun little subjects that I've been able to find, let alone all the ones that are still being waiting to be published. And I, I can only imagine the little things and fruits of knowledge that uh, Brian has over there. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let's get into this. I kind of want to before we get into the 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 fun Nano Tyrannus and the 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 Megalodon and Kelp and stuff like that that I was really excited about, I feel like we should focus on Zach and these in in you know Brian since you are going to be are you participating in both? Uh, yes. Oh, you are, man. So you get to hang out with Brian multiple times, man. That's just two weeks, me and Brian plus on the road, man, yeah, checking out museums awesome. and having an adventure. That's can't wait. That's gonna be awesome. Uh, so let's go ahead. Let, you know, you don't have to sell me on these things, but let, let's let's talk about these these fun events that you guys going on got going on. Uh, the first one is going to be in Arizona, California, uh, from May second to May tenth uh, this year, and then the second one is Utah and Colorado, May thirteenth to the twentieth. So let's go ahead and start with the Arizona one. What's got we got going on here? 
Yeah, sure. So that's the one we're calling uh, Route 66 million years ago. Um, that's where we're headed out there. So, and, you know, it's both of these, I think we can talk about these almost uh, together as far as what I'm yeah. talking about for these trips. And, and Brian can really get into the details of, of what we'll be seeing at these museums. But these are two trips that if uh, museums are your thing, then this is these are the trips for you. These are museum heavy, um, you know, not overly heavy. We're not doing three museums a day. We're not overstuffing it, but museums on the rich collection of museums that are in that part of the world. Uh, we just, we couldn't skip, you know, what we what's on this itinerary. You have to get in there. Um, and so we're starting out in uh, Phoenix. We're finishing in Los Angeles. We'll go over the kind of museums that we're hitting uh, as we go through this on, a, on a, with Brian. Um, but yeah, that one's nine days across and it's just gonna be a small group of us uh, getting at some of the spots, incredible access, thanks to Brian, that we're going to get into places that you just, the normal public can't get into at all. You know, we're going to see things, we're going to see holotypes um, of some incredible species, uh, you know, which as I, I, I'm sure your listeners know what a holotype is and have a good understanding, but as I was explaining it to, you know, the folks who subscribe to my Dinosaur Trips Dispatch newsletter, um, you know, it's basically like, this is the original pressing of a great record or it's the first printing of one of those great novels you know this is the og this is the one you want to see and and brag about everything else is is kind of comes after this uh, and so really excited to kind of get all that special access all that special knowledge and as you were talking about like brian's going to be along for every step of the way so this isn't just you know, we're jumping into a museum, we find out a little bit about a place, not to mention we maybe hear something repeated from the last tour guide that you had. I've, I've had that happen on so many trips I've done in my life. It's like, yeah, I, that was interesting at stop one in, in Barcelona. Now I know, <laughs> I know about that part. Like I've heard it every time, you know, instead we're going to have a real continuous story kind of mm. pushing us along and Brian's going to be there to answer any questions we might have. We'll go deep on things like by nature, all dinosaur trips are a little bit nerdy. Mm. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're looking for what is a, a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity to go truly nerdy, this is for the, you know, if museums are your jam, these are the two trips that are that are absolutely for you because we're we're seeing some of the best collections, uh, certainly in that part of the world. I think you could argue, even if you extend that out, these are some really rich, incredible collections. And we're throwing in other stuff too. We're going to be doing amazing hikes. We're going to, I mean, we're doing the Grand Canyon. Like we're in Arizona. Of course, we're going to be doing the Grand oh, Canyon. Oh, yeah. That's... But we're going to be doing the Grand Canyon with Brian. And, you know, we're going to get, and we're going to be looking at it from probably a slightly different angle. Not literally, but but maybe some special, and <laughs> we'll see where we get. But you know, looking at it for, through the perspective of everything that we're doing on this trip as well, and I think that's really going to get a lot of fun context in there. Uh, and then you know, on this first one, May second to tenth, as we're in Los Angeles, well, we're not going to do a whole dinosaur theme trip and not go to Universal Studios and do the Jurassic World ride. Like, of course, we're going to throw that in. Oh, uh, so we're doing that for a day, and you know, for the for the for the nerdy listener out there, um, you know, that's that also means harry potter that means back to the future that means everything that universal studios brings you know no matter where it is that your that your nerddom falls so that's and then we're of course finishing it with you know it's not it's not dinosaurs but la brea tar pits and uh everything else in between it's 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 gonna be an awesome awesome uh nine days that we spend just kind of getting across arizona and california then utah colorado it's it's kicking off in salt lake city we're ending in denver and uh you know, the Rocky Mountains, that one's called Red Rocks and Raptors. Uh, so I think you get a real sense of what that is. We're stopping in Vernal to visit, you know, Dinah, the giant pink uh, dinosaur as well. So we got those kitschy elements. We're doing, we're, we're doing, uh, Kind of everything you would want to do on one of these on one of these trips, you know. For if if you're into dinosaurs, uh, if paleontology is your bag, and if, or if you just like you want to see parts of museums you never get to see, will never get to see. This is the trip. This is the opportunity. You know, I don't know. Dinosaur trips is going to go a lot of places over the years, um, but we're not always going to be doing something like this. You know, or we may be doing it in a completely different destination. This is your chance to go to these museums with this incredible access come with us in may uh for for what i think is going to be you know really a, a two two experiences of a lifetime kevin say something i i have no words right now so that's actually that's huge because i mentioned i was going to do this interview to my wife and it's dinosaurchips.com and she's like so you 
go sleep in a tent in the desert and dig up dinosaur. It's so much more than that. It's an entire vacation it's and there is excavation, but there's also luxury food, hotels, uh, sites, activities. It's an all inclusive event. And, and the yeah. worst part is you're going to universal studios with a paleontologist. You're going to <laughs> Jurassic park. I am so envious right now. I'm glad there's video so you guys can see the tears of envy in my eyes right now. This is like legitimately like, oh my. Still a few spots available. Yeah. Do you do you think my wife's <laughs> going to allow me to have that much fun by myself? Are you kidding? Bring them along. It's a perfect I, balance. <laughs> I'm right. You guys, you guys do do the family thing. You I don't think my three-year-old's year olds. up. Yeah, I, I do have a 12-year-old, but. Well, the, then what are we doing? Come I on. have the twins. I have the twins. Oh, you know, if, I mean, if you're going to babysit them, Zach, I'm totally down. I'm in. Let's do this. We can work this <laughs> out. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, no, but that's this legitimately does sound fun. And I, I like the idea of actually getting to do the behind the scenes parts of museums because there's a whole lot you guys, we as a public, does not get to see. And there's so many different things that they can't put on display because, you know, limited space and they have to rotate stuff out timely. And then there's some stuff that's too fragile, so you can't take it out anymore. And so you get to see these things that are just like, wow, like there's, I, I don't know how else to put it. Like that's, I'm giddy excited over here. Now you like, this is, this is fun. And I've had Brian on the show a few times and he is always excited about dinosaurs. So like the fact that he's getting to do this stuff with an audience there to just feed off of his energy. I can't imagine. I, I, I can only imagine what it would be like, what the equivalent of me on like Red Bull and energy drinks. Like, I just imagine you're going to be bouncing off of your, like everything. Um, oh, when we put this trip together, yeah, I looked around and said, so this is, this is almost like a loop I run every couple of years, every year or two, I go to all these places and more. And I said, well, what would be really fun? And they're different because a lot of museums, there's only so many specimens you can buy. There's only a mm -hmm. couple of providers in the world. So there's a lot of sameness across museums. So this is one that was, was intentionally selected with these museums for either the backstage access, the cool specimens on display, the unique factor, and just the fun in, in the city itself. So we we put together really a, a top shelf, you know, best of the best who's who of museums to visit and places you've never heard of as well. Most likely people haven't heard of the ALF Museum or the Western Science Center, but these museums both captured my eye as a person who spends you know, 150 days last year in museums. So I hit 70 museums last year, mm -hmm. 71. So I go to a lot of different facilities and these two places jumped out as, wow, this would be, where would I take my parents? Where would I take my friends that I would want to show off? And this is a highlight reel of museums. Did we get them all? No. In fact, I've received Zach a number of emails. Hey, why didn't, why are we not on this? Hey, consider us for next time. So I said, yeah, well, well I know, but for reason x y or z these are the places and the behind the scene access i've been at this since 1994 so this is my 30th year of goofing around with dinosaurs and i i know so many of these folks i went to grad school with i i we grew up together through the ranks and they're now in positions where they can let us see things they can take us in the back room they've got the key and the code <laughs> and they don't have to ask permission because they are the boss and we're going to be meeting the paleontologists who've been on documentaries. These are people on TV shows, on YouTube videos. These are individuals that are writing books that people are reading. They're writing papers. They're making contributions to science today. And a lot of these folks will be people they know or people that they've read about. Mm -hmm. And it'll be so cool because we, I pick people that also that are able to interact with the public. A lot of the paleontologists, they're sequestered away in their world of long dead things and they just want to be left alone and, and work on that. I, I've We found folks that are going to be dynamic and exciting. And the best part with me on the trip, I think for these trips that makes it truly unique is the ability to customize. If someone shows up and uh, before they even arrive, we're going to find out what they're interested in. If we have someone that's a huge tyrannosaur expert or wants to see tyrannosaurs, I'll make sure that not only do we have the history of all the animals on display, but we'll try to get extra special. Hey, you want to go see Teratophonius' holotype? Come here. 
We're going to go check that out for you. And we'll make as much of those as possible so we can even customize within the museums the experiences that people want and look at. Wow. And it's not just dinosaurs. I know we talk about dinosaurs. And I've had people on social media say, well, why do you have this mastodon in a dinosaur trip? It says dinosaur trip. Well, because mammals are really cool, too. And there are lots of mammal fans. And every museum has amazing mammals on display that we're going to walk over and look at. And it's a wonderful comparative anatomy to look at dinosaurs and teeth and claws and the convergent evolution and then where they're different. And so in the end, we're always going to be subtly learning something while having a really good time. Because like you said, I'm energetic, excitable. And just this is just fun. So, so, so let me ask you this. And, and you know, I I know you can't speak for every paleontologist, but when you do stuff like this, when you, you know, this is correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first tour you you're getting to yes. actually be on with that. Okay. So when you have moments like this, does it reinvigorate you and fellow pale paleontologists to have these kind of interactions with the public to where you get to take them behind the scenes and they get to see everything and they get excited. Does it reinvigorate what you in what you do as a paleontologist? So me personally, I'm always invigorated. Mm -hmm. I do this by myself in an echo chamber because I talk to myself. It's all great. So <laughs> I, I am the energizer of excitement there. Mm -hmm. But I, I truly know from hearing from my buddies, they it's Tuesday. They walk in the lab and it's a Tuesday to them. They're not thinking that that there is the supersaurus scapula coracoid that's nine feet long almost. And that is this amazing ceratosaurus jaw that no one has seen but you and two researchers. That's just what they do. But when the people come in, it, it really reminds them often, especially the guys that have been at it 40, 50 years. You know, they, they it helps them, but it's like blowing on that spark that's always there. And it does make them smiley and happy and they can turn around and show off. And what always happens is they have an audience and they start talking about things that aren't in the literature that they haven't published on their observations. And that's my favorite time because now I'm hearing about things that are going to be coming down the pipe in a few years. And they're just talking because they get excited when they see an audience that's interested in what they're doing. That's awesome. That is very, very cool. So, I mean, like I said, both of those trips sound absolutely amazing. Legitimately jealous. Uh, I, I wish nothing but the best for you guys. Uh, there are a few seats left, you said? You'll get a few spots. Okay, there is a few spots left. So, you know, it's today is the 5th and this is going out on Wednesday. So there's a, there's a few spots left. So hopefully they'll, maybe there'll be one or two left, ladies and gentlemen, if, you know, you guys can get in. If not, I, I, I'm sure you guys will be definitely doing more trips. So I look forward to see what you guys have going on in the future as well. Um, seriously, I, I, I'm, I'm so excited. I legitimately wish I was going. Kevin, you should totally go. You know, you've got way less kids than I do. I'm only going with you. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll, make, we'll, make this, we'll make a date out of this. It'll be sweet. We'll hold hands and everything. It'll be great. Actually, um, what uh, Brian was talking about, yeah. um, you know, in your question, re reinvigorating people's interest. Um I, I think when you say things like that, your two appearances on the show, Brian, and the last one with you, Zach, um, are my favorite episodes that I've listened to of this podcast. And it you, you're like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of paleontology. You make it so interesting for people that don't know anything about the subject. Just your enthusiasm, it's it's magnetizing. And even though I don't understand a lot of it, I love hearing it, and it makes me interested and want to hear more about it. Um nine shades of red right now thank you those are very kind no and and that's why I'm, I'm so excited to have brian you know being the paleo expert uh, on these trips is uh, because we need somebody who can you know it's not hard to get folks like myself excited about going to a museum and, and seeing fossils and holotypes and just a t-rex the just a, even the images behind brian right now I'm like yeah can't wait but you know <laughs> as you were saying like Oh, okay. could I get my wife to come along? Can I get your partner or the kids interested, even if they're of age, you know? And um, not every paleontologist, not every museum guide has it in them to invite everyone into that world, make it seem accessible, make it seem understandable, um, answer your questions excitedly instead of annoyed. Uh, but Brian does, you know, and that's yeah. why it's that's why. He, the choosing the right expert to lead these these programs is so important to to my side of the equation when I'm putting these things together. You know that's really important to have somebody, um, and it's heartening for me to even hear you say that. You know, uh, 
leading into this is like, yeah, you know, I've got the right guy for this. This is this is somebody who can fire people up about paleontology. And I saw that happen with the with some a few of the, the paleontologists that we had up in Alberta last year. You know, so you get the right person. We had the right person out in Dinosaur Provincial Park, and it changes their ability to invite more people in to this enthusiasm for paleontology and for dinosaurs and uh, you know that's one of the missions of the company that was one of the reasons I set out to do this thing was to to give people like myself a chance to get into the spaces they maybe never dreamed they could have and to get people who are a little bit more on the periphery um you know welcome into this camp where we're, we're kind of uh, the more inquiries and requests for trips and questions I get about what we're doing I see a come and you know the fossil crates gang learning about dinosaur trips, I really see a growing community of people. So I'm excited, you know, this year we all get together and we do the American Southwest and, you know, who knows where the future holds. And I expect people will be coming on these trips multiple times as we all explore together. And uh, yeah. so it's really exciting to, to think that, you know, this is, this is about promoting that excitement um, in people about paleontology, if, about dinosaurs. If I can jump in here real quick though, it, and it's uh, the reason why I'm working with dinosaur trips is Zach. So you've got a guy who's been doing this for 15 plus years of organizing trips. And I've got, I've done my fair share of adventures. Normally I go on my own, but uh, my wife is not a fan of my way of traveling, which is I wake up, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where we're staying at night. We'll figure it out when we get there. Not cool. So we spent a month in New Zealand and she had us map out everything by day and it about broke my heart. I couldn't, it's like, <laughs> I don't know on day 19 because what happens if day four is really, really amazing and I need five days there. I can't plan past the next hour. So I, I got to experience trying to plan this, this multi-month expedition we did by trying to get detailed and it, it liked to, I said never again. And then I meet Zach and Zach makes it he gets a coach. He's got the hotels. And it's not the places I stay behind a fire station in the backseat of a car because it's safe. It's noisy, but very safe. No one busts into a fire station. So this is the kind of things that we don't, we're, we're going to be in real hotels, not in the lowest possible bargain stretching hotel that I picked um, because I have my own sleeping bag. So bed bugs don't bother me. And Zach's got us flown restaurants that don't involve a, a buy one, get one coupon or my McDonald's points for my $2 <laughs> breakfast sandwich. Because as a paleontologist, every dollar counts. So you just stretch them as far as possible. And we're going to be doing non-paleo things as well. Because I've also discovered, even though my wife is, is part of the paleontological family, she gets tired of museums day after day. And so Zach has, has in this travel experience, is, mixed it up enough to okay we've done a lot here now let's go do this and it's this real nice flow as we leap from it reminds me of just going lily pad to lily pad but the steps are between museums but the, as you step it's really nice scenery so mm -hmm. it's fun things and i was just a couple days ago on route 66 zach i, I went to a falconry i wanted to study some uh some birds of prey up close so I went to where the sky island falconry two thumbs up or uh, Jamaica was her name. The person, the birds were amazing too. And I drove on Route 66 and it made me smile. We went out to uh, Keepers of the Wild, which is a zoo, uh, animal sanctuary. And just the, you forget the undulating hills and to go back in, in just recent time and to think about how important Route 66 was. So there's a lot of history that's going to go on this first Arizona, California trip, but that's all because of Zach bringing these yeah. things to the attention. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks Zach for doing that. Yeah. Uh, number one, uh, if you guys don't have shirts that say route 66 million and like with like a decrepit like sign, I will be sorely disappointed. Number one, number two, I know we've been inflating Brian's ego over here, which is great. I love doing this all day, but seriously, Zach, yeah, I'm glad he said it because if he didn't, I was going to say, seriously, dude, don't sell yourself short, even remotely the, the scheduling and everything that you do and the memories that you are making, especially with the, your company is astounding. And you're taking something that all of us obviously are, here, are on some level passionate about and taking it to the nth level. And I have nothing but like kudos for you, sir, like mad props to you. Like seriously. I appreciate you. You both saying such kind of things, but I mean, in reality, I'm in, this is me indulging myself. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that, that's all it is. <laughs> so I can't really take, it's really kind. Um, 
but yeah, this is this is me indulging the things that I want to do in the world and, and finding the people who want to do them with me. And we we go out there and uh, we have ourselves an adventure. I mean, I've I, I I probably told a version of this story on the last podcast. So I'll keep it quick, but like the. the a big part or a significant part of my, my dinosaur enthusiasm stemmed from my uncle he used to go on these motorbike trips all across North America uh, during the summers and he'd send us stuff back. Um, and, you know, stuff would come out of Utah and stuff would come out of Colorado and stuff would come out of the badlands of Alberta. And just the word, the badlands. I was like, oh, my God, that sounds amazing. And so, <laughs> you know, the fact that uh, I, you know these destinations have been selected, one, because because Brian knew them well. And, uh, you know, this was we were we were heading into his various backyards over over his lifetime so we could really get that expertise into all the level but also like when i was circling spots of dreaming this company up and saying where do i want to go what are the spots that have stuck in my mind as the iconic kind of places to go it was yes the paleontology of these spots but also you know route 66 I, that, that's very romantic in the ideals of somebody like me who enjoys chasing adventure and travel around the world it's you know? nostalgic the grand canyon is is an incredible idea like the, the what else are we we're seeing? Um, what else are we seeing uh, as we go through this? You know, Joshua we're, Tree. We're going to go to Joshua Tree. Yeah, that's what I was trying to come up with. Joshua Tree National Park. I mean, these these are just like you can't believe that all of this is packed in in between the these museums and this incredible access. So it's you know you're going to get you're, you're going to get what I hope, what I my intention with this, and what I what I plan to deliver to our guest is the amazing paleontology. Thanks to Brian, but also just, you know, an amazing destination experience, something that that is it's, you know, gives you a sense of these places that we're visiting, it gives you a sense of the the prehistory and the current the more recent history and the current culture like you, you want to experience each of those things in each of the destinations. I mean, Los Absolutely. Angeles is a city you go to. Um, yeah, because it's got a great history. Yeah, we're going to hit some like some awesome museums like the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and we're going to be going to La Brea Tar Pits. But it's also LA. LA is a modern city and we, you know we're going to have some time to just explore LA if you haven't been there before. I have and you know you can visit LA a lot of times. There's a lot of things to there do. There is a lot. So so I'm no I'm excited about every part of it. I mean it's it's more than just the dinosaurs. Um the dinosaurs kind of gave us our compass, our map as as Brian said, they're the lily pads that we jump between, but then everything else is we're we're gonna be we're gonna be doing our best to absorb all they got all of that and get deep in it too. So. That's awesome. I, you know, I, I want to emphasize one last thing. I, you're talking about all these great things, but I don't think you guys can appreciate and wrap your mind around this is you're taking a paleontologist to Jurassic Park. Like <laughs> that is literally every like kid's dream is to go to Jurassic Park with a paleontologist and you guys are doing it. I'm... And then have him just cut it down. At every oh. moment. Like, inaccurate, <laughs> inaccurate, ridiculous. I'm much friendlier. Uh, I will put positive spins. Our knowledge has evolved yeah. or they didn't read this reference. We'll still get there just in a, in a kinder, gentler machine gun hand. <laughs> you can you can be the kind one i'll be the one that's like oh, <laughs> hey, we should reach out to universal and see if they'll let us go behind the scenes because i'm there oh i'll try I... that yeah we'll talk zach if you got a few minutes after this let's let's briefly chat because i think that, that that's got legs oh definitely steve right. send an email you've got pool I've got pool. I've 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 got that flex. Uh, actually, I do know a few people that work over at Universal Studios. I might actually be able. To... There we go. It's called networking. Oh, love it! All right. <laughs> so going transitioning from this, it, it, it's time to get into everyone's favorite part, where we get uh, Brian all hyped up on some dinosaur news here. So let's go ahead and let's start with the uh, the nano here, sir. Oh my! What's all the news about this. So. True story, as they all are when I tell them, because it's easier to remember. Uh, the We're at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meetings, and Nick Longrich is a gentleman I've known since he was, you know, he came, anyway, I've known him for his entire paleo career, and he's really a uh, an extraordinarily bright individual. I, I, he's the kind of guy, like, that guy's smart. And he's standing next to me, and he's got this wry, he's got this, like, impish grin on his face. And then he's like, I'm like, what'd you do? And he's like, I just pulled the pin. I said, what do you mean? He submitted the preprint at the dinosaur convention on the nano paper. So he literally 
whole fire, you know, shouted fire in the movie theater with everyone around him. And so within minutes, because it goes live on the server and everyone's getting a little alert that this new paper comes out and it's ultra controversial with all of the all of the players in the game politically standing in the same room. For me, as my uh, anthropological upbringing, it was utterly delightful to sit back with my popcorn and watch and listen to the buzz. And it's become a religion Nano has for many folks. It's you fall on the camp of it's absolutely a Tyrannosaurus. It's a teenage T-Rex. I call it no-no Tyrannus because it's just such controversy. It's no-no. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got the other side that in some ways is poking the bear. They're trying to say, are you really sure? Because when you look at the skulls of this individual here, if you can see my hand, I don't know if you can see it on my screen, but if you look at the tiny one, wait, here we go. If you look at that skull, this is a Jane, the teenage T-Rex. And then this is a T-Rex. There is, when you get up close, this one has way more teeth. The proportions are very different. And so the one camp says it's within the range of morphological variation, ontogeny, change of life through time. If you look at our heads and are big and our bodies are small, and then we go the other way as we eat sugar. And so our bodies get big and our heads get you know, disproportionately not, and they don't keep up, thankfully. So the thought is that that's going on, that it's losing teeth because it's diet shifting and we see this reptiles do lose teeth as they get older and many taxa. So there's this range of variation argument, but then there's, there's noticeably a complete absence of creatures that the, the, the argument then becomes, and this is what the crux of the nano argument is in a way, is if nano Tyrannus is just a teenage T-Rex, well, then we don't have any other animals. This is an ecosystem with one animal that is the dominant predator from baby to adult. If you look at the Morris information, you have Saurophaganax and Torbosaurus, the T-Rex equivalents, the largest terrestrial predators of their day, walking about, doing a good job of being the T-Rex and the Jurassic. But they're not the only predator. You have Marchosaurus, Stoxosaurus, Canicolagrius, Solorus, Allosaurus. You have all of the um, Ceratosaurus. You have all of these predators, these various size. If you look at the African savanna today, you have the lion, the big beast. But then you also have various species of jackals. You have hyenas. You have all kinds of smaller cats. You've got leopards and cheetahs. So you have these creatures that occupy these different niches. And Nano Tyrannus to the Nano Tyrannus side is doing that. It is in their argument that their study is saying that Nano Tyrannus is an adult and it's not a juvenile. And therefore it's, it's near adulthood. It's as big as it got. And it occupied this middle niche. The Tyrannosaurus camp says, no, you need to show us differences between a baby and an adult Nano versus T-Rex. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what, what's, frustrating is I've seen the material that just isn't in press yet where the long rich and his compatriots have the baby T-Rex and it's clearly a T-Rex and it's it's a hatchling like a die in the nest kind of baby mm -hmm. and this is different than the small nano material so it, it is quite the interesting debate because on some levels it's like they talk past each other it's almost in, in one side, the side is saying, show me proof, you know, show me proof. You've got to prove that it's there. And the other side, the nano side is saying, well, let's just use common sense. And just because we haven't found it yet doesn't mean it's not true. Mm -hmm. And so they're almost from different paradigms coming at this problem. And if it was any other animal but T-Rex, this would be a pedantic discussion in the, in the halls of paleo conferences. Nobody would, and some Discord servers for some grad students. No one would talk about this, but because it's the king, and it's it's wonderful. Uh, there there are there are people like myself. I'm in the. I don't care. I'm a dog in the fight, so to speak. I don't have a Rex in the in the brawl. I'm a sauropod guy, so I don't care. So I have my own battles, and I fight vehemently. In fact, I'm presenting on the 17th the history of one dumb bone, one bone, not dumb. It's a, it's a maddening bone uh, from South Korea. And it's all this insanity. It would be fun. 
I should put it as a YouTube. Maybe I will. I'll record the talk. It's got to be one of the most ludicrous backstories of a bone that you'll ever run across. The series of boneheaded decisions made by the paleontologist on this are epically incompetent. They go to the Marsh Cope level of nonsense. And they weren't <laughs> even competing. It's just, are you kidding me? And then when you think the people that come in to try to put out the fire, they go and call, they knock over more fuel onto the fire with more typos and misunderstandings. It doesn't help that half the literature in this animal is in Korean, old high Korean, where the modern kids can't read it. So yeah, I'm getting off topic here. But Nanotyrannus, the punchline is uh, they make, in my opinion, a pretty compelling argument as to why it's a separate taxon. Now, in April of last year, I went and toured a bunch of museums, and I just inadvertently saw all of the nano material in private hands, in public hands. It's not been published on yet, and then in the stuff in the literature. It's just the way my arc took me. I wasn't intending for that, and if I had thought, I would have done a little kind of travel log. And as I talk to the different camps, it's almost as if you're, uh, you're, you're playing some kind of role-playing game and you're rolling into a new village and you don't know if they're on your team or if they're not on your team and you're not sure how to, how to position it. If you get the sense they're anti-nano, then you jump in and then they show you everything. Hmm. And um, bro Tyranno is the same way. But what was crazy was I see the nano Tyrannus people's argument because the, the variation, I study variation, and in the sauropods, if you had this much variation, you'd probably make them different species at the very least, if not different genera. You just would. Mm -hmm. But because there's such a cult of personality in some ways, it's it's just interesting to watch. The tyrann the, the meat-eating researchers, they're a lot like their animals. They, they fight one another and they bite and they're mean. The sauropod guys, we for the most part, we just kind of bump shoulders and... You know, we're, we're munching a lot, I disagree, and then we're happily, we go out for beers in the evening. There's really no animosity like these guys. They can't be in the same room. It's amazing. <laughs> in fact, while I'm on a, a, a sonic tsunami here, at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meetings, there was one Tyrannosaurus speaker, and he, you, know, you have 12 minutes of talk, three minutes of questions, and another paleontologist got up and verbally punched him in the throat. The guy didn't even know how to read. He's like, well, that is about as, he didn't see it coming. He He's not, you know, he's a typer, but now they're face to face and the guy is big and bulky and booming and he hit him really hard with a great point. And the guy was not prepared. I was like, wow, this is like paleoanthropology conferences where they just, you know, they're going to sword fight up there as a duel at the end. It's Red Rising. They're going to get their swords out and their, their uh, right, what do they call those things? The, the rapiers? The whips. Oh, yeah, that yes. too. So that was amazing. Even to me, from the, that was the, the next level of just the Tyrannosaur animosity. Tyrannosity. There's a good word. That's a great word. I like that. Uh, I'm right now down. Shirt. Copyright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, tyrannomosity. It's just, it's a real thing. These guys don't, they don't give up. And I don't understand why it's got to be this way. But the upside and the thing that I do take heart in is once these, and the Spinosaur crowd is the exact same. They're just crazy. But <laughs> when they're pushing and pulling and tearing at the ideas in 20 years from now, they'll have, they'll have really strengthened science. It's steel on steel. It's just why do you got to cut through bone and when you're doing this? Why why can't we just have you know why can't we all get along? I don't, I don't <laughs> LA, that's how we'll close. Yeah. So Zach, you were gonna say something and then I have a question for you. Yeah, I, well, I had a question uh for Brian, which is like, is it fair to compare, you know, what you what your expertise is, uh your your field of study within paleontology? Is that like the the equivalent of your astrological side? Like can we you you say what you're studying and we can get a sense of what kind of person we're talking about? I think the animal group you study will tell you more about the astrology sign than the actual <laughs> parts of the animal. Uh, because the tyrannosaur researchers are studying the same vertebral variation that the sauropod researchers are studying. But they're just armed with right. red of tooth and claw. And I'm just built for pushing and cushion. You know, it's very different to see the, the differences. Studying this, I, before this call, I was on a conversation with a grad student studying um, vertebral variation in exactly what we're talking about in uh, dorsal vertebrae of some theropods. 
And they call me because they're like, Brian, you've seen thousands of vertebrae and variation. And I could sense, you know, that, that, that edge to them. They're like looking to jab their opponents. Whereas the sauropod guys would be truly, you know, let's just kind of figure all this out. Let's pool all of our resources. And he's like, yeah. And so you're telling me that he's copiously taking notes. And I'm like, wow, I'm, I feel like an arms maker. I'm just supplying <laughs> it with hollow points. Again, LA. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if this is, for, for some reason, I thought this this might be a thing. Uh, are we capable of telling the age of a dinosaur by bone density, or is the fossils too calcified for that? So or mineralized. We don't, the, the answer is mostly yes, okay. because of lags, lines of arrested growth. So think of tree rings. Mm -hmm. and so, and I'm actually trying to buy. Well, it's a CT scanner. I'm deep into a, a consortium that's looking to procure a CT scanner for paleo work, a spectral CT scanner from Philips. And the reason I want to be part of this project is I want people to stop destroying dinosaur bones to do histology to figure out how old it is. I'm tired of it because when I go and pick up a big sauropod bone, there's chunks missing out of it, mm -hmm. and then they crack. It's a big mess. I don't like it. But what they do is you run it through a, a micro CT scanner or a CT scanner or a synchrotron if you can get your hands on one. And then it peers into the bone. And as the animals grow, it leaves these lines, just like a tree ring. And you can count them. I might even have a screen background that shows them. And uh, so that's how you get these age. It was 13 at death. It was 23 at death. So the punchline of all of it is, yes, you can age dinosaurs. Uh, counting the tree ring growth. And that's that's one of the things that's done quite regularly. It's fairly robust. And it gives you a minimum age because you don't necessarily, did you take one year or two years? How long before your first ring appears? That's mm -hmm. that's that's the area. So it's a, it's a minimum age, but it's not a maximum. You could add a couple of years onto it conceivably because of just how they get laid down. So I think you know where my question's going here with. Why couldn't they do that with a the nano and a regular tyrannosaurus and be like okay we have it, not it, even to the point of okay here's a tyrannosaurus we know we think is around 15 years old here is a nano that we think might be around the age could they is so, it simple as black and white is that or no it, yes but always a but there's always a but the original nano tyrannus was usually was called gorgosaurus land census and it was renamed Nanotyrannus in the 80s. And it's just a skull. And no one, A, skulls don't lay down the lag lines. You need limb bones or ribs. You need some appendicular element, a tibia, a femur, a humerus, a rib. All we have of the original nano is the skull. So there's nothing we can do. And you normally, that's what you want to find. You make all these great comparisons. But in this case, it's just complicated the universe. Uh, part two, these other specimens, there's, a, there's another. It's a taxonomic conundrum. Most researchers agree that the holotype, the one bone, the name-bearing bone of Nanotyrannus is probably a teenage T-Rex. So even if you prove that these other Nanotyrannus specimens, you can't use the word Nanotyrannus because it's taken. And that's going to always be subsumed under T-Rex, assuming that's a teenage T-Rex after all. In which case, these other specimens are going to either get a new name, or if you do what Jim Jensen did, he got so ticked off when Ultrasaurus was taken, he said, I'm still keeping Ultrasaurus, but I'm ending it in an OS. So dun 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 dun, dun little vanilla ice back when he was saying, <laughs> I didn't rip off Queen. Dun 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 dun. dun. Yeah, come on. Now. <laughs> so the same that. deal. Um, they're going to have to rename it. And I think the dueling dinosaurs, uh, when James Napoli comes up with whatever he ends up publishing on, that's going to be he. So if you watch as the Battle of Five Armies, you've got all of these individuals warring right now on the ground. You got the orcs. We'll call the orcs the Nanotyrannus clan. And you've got the dwarves and the elves united in the T-Rex side. And then they're battling it. And then you've got, but the orcs are big and massive. And then they've got smog comes in. You know, they're bringing in the firepower. So the fifth army, well, it's uh, Tom Bombadil's troops, the guys that are going to make the battles different. <laughs> That's Napoli. He's going to, he's a voice of reason. He's got the best preserved skeleton. He's got cranial and postcranial elements. 
and he's going to write into the fray. And what his paper comes out is going to really shift the side of the folks on the sideline who've been watching this 15 round heavyweight brawl. He's going to come in and say, this is what it is. He's extremely careful. He's bright. He's, he's, it's, it's his career making paper. So he's going to take his time and do it right. So that's going to be an extraordinarily important specimen. I, I love that that we're going to have this select group of listeners who are just like fanatic about uh, Lord of the Rings that are just going to sit there and go, I get that reference. I totally get that. I Alex will absolutely be like, yeah, I get that reference. That's a good <laughs> I, friend of ours. For the rest of us smooth brains out there, I want to break this down <laughs> real quick. So we have wolves and somebody found a coyote and they think it's a baby wolf. Yes. I thank you. All right. They, everyone, you're welcome. But uh, thank you, Brian. This is why I keep Kevin on the show. <laughs> I'm stealing <laughs> that, Kevin. I'll actually cite you. This is from Kevin. He, he, he took my verbosity. I'm a scientist. <laughs> Hooray. I, I love it. Absolutely love it. So what Kevin said, that's the problem. And, <laughs> and it's a great battle. And you see this, the, just like the Spinosaur. Was it aquatic? Was it an aquatic pursuit predator, which today is like an otter or a shark? Or was it a heron? that wandered the shores and the one guy's made his career off spino and he's got a vested interest in keeping an aquatic well as soon as you put your in paleo on a popular animal everyone's going to come at you from all sides and so that's what he's getting hit by again and again and it's making the science much better and that's what the good thing about all these battles is it does pull everything forward yeah i love that so let's transition into unless you have anything else Brian, about oh, I, I can go for days. So <laughs> uh, this let's, is what you get if you go oh, on I, dinosaur trips. You're going to get action like this. I love it. I, Until I, you I, tap out and say, I'm done, Brian, no moss. <laughs> when you don't get up off your chair, was it Roberto <laughs> Duran? I got. I, I can understand that moment. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so let's move on to another big one uh, tonight. Let's talk about Megalodon because this one was interesting. I I, I like this. Uh so this one I actually heard on NPR and they were talking about the controversy behind Megalodon because, you know, it's, you know what, I'm just going to stop there because no matter what I say, it's not going to be nearly as good as what you would say, Brian. So I'm just going to hand true. this back to you. So <laughs> Megalodon, so I'm going to give you my opinion first and mm. then we'll get into what they talk about. Yeah, please. How can I say this reasonably? kind so if any of the folks that research them don't hate me for this <laughs> yep. hold on this is all you have mm -hmm. yeah this is it and you got a bunch of these and now you're going to go tell all kinds of stories paleontologists are failed novelists <laughs> most of us are decent short story writers these guys are haiku I mean, they're absolutely, let me turn the camera off and turn it back on. No, it's all uh, good. Definitely got a view of it. Yeah, no, but I'm blurry now. I look mm, oh, you're fine. No worries. So the, uh, so, so, as a result, this is what you have to work with. You've mm -hmm. got this bone. There we go. And mm -hmm. now they looked at the, the Mako study, if you will. So they've taken these bones and they've measured them every possible way. And they've tried to come up with the shape of the body from the tooth. Mm -hmm. Now, conveniently enough, we have sharks alive today, mm -hmm. and they've interpreted all different lengths, sizes, all from a tooth. It's, I feel bad for shark researchers, because though teeth are laden with info, that's just next level, uh, I don't want to say guesswork, hypothesizing. And Scientific no, guesses. Yeah, and there's, and there's no way to really test it. Mm -hmm. So this group went back and looked at one of my, one of the specimens. It's on my, everybody's got a bucket list. Mm -hmm. I want to see these vertebrae. They're in Belgium. They're this whole, it's this whole series of the, so sharks die. They sink to the bottom of the ocean. They get eaten. They disappear. They don't have any bones that fossilize. But in this particular instance, it fell into whatever water chemistry was there, took the calcium and they managed to solidify it. And you see this a lot with a shark called Protoxy rhina in the Western interior seaways. It's about the great white shark size. And you get these beautiful vertebrae. And you're, the first time I saw it, I said, what the heck? How do you do that? It's cartilage. And just for whatever reason, we got lucky. And so there's this one famous megalodon specimen. So mm. everybody's arguing over that specimen. It's like nano. You, you know, they're all arguing over the same thing. 
Um, and the punchline here is now someone has decided based on the vertebrae and some, some fancy math that it, it's not this giant great white beast that everyone makes it out to be. And every year it seems to get an extra 10 feet long and 30 extra tons, it feels like. So not only can we not keep it, is it Carcharocles, Carcharodon megalodon, Otodus megalodon, that seemed to carry the day. These guys were going back to the Carcharocles, which surprised me. So the punchline is they look at these bones, they look at the different proportions, and they decide that it's more of a mako shark body as opposed to this more corpulent great white shark body. And I thought that was interesting, their, their line of logic. But just as Nano and T-Rex, there are multiple camps in the great white shark world, and they are every bit as hostile and vicious. And I can promise you, once that paper hit the stands, the other team is already working earnestly to point out every possible flaw from you had two spaces after a period to bigger issues, just whatever they can do to spin it the other direction, because these are, uh, th these are very passionate people on a very popular product. Hmm. The, I, I, in this case, I'll go back to all I've seen. Does that look like a Mako to you? If you not really, it looks more like a great white to me. It, I had like, I, I can't argue that, but I guess from my mind, I, I guess what I would be perceiving, and again, not the paleontologist here, but based on the teeth that you like that we have and what would it be competing against? What are its predators? What is its prey? What defenses would it need? Would it be more practical for it to be more slender and speedier versus more robust like a great white? Well, it and, seems to have enjoyed whales. It ate okay. whales. And whales, in fact, didn't get really giant until after it went extinct. Uh, and there's and it had a competitor. It's always something bigger. Livia tan these macro raptorial sperm whales. So sperm whales today have teeth in the lower jaw. They're pretty docile guys. You know, they eat squid. They've got the big superpower blasting the rings out and stun the fish. Uh, but that, you know, rewind the clock 10 million years ago and these things had teeth on their upper jaw as well. And they too shredded whales. They were killer whales of their day and they were absolute behemoths, just, just stunning creatures. So just like the great white shark meets the killer whale, killer whale wins 100 out of 100 battles. Similarly, I suppose Megalodon, no matter how big it was, when it runs across a Liviatan or another one of these massive carnivorous whale eating whales, it's going to go, whoa, I don't, I, I'm out because they're going to be intelligent and big brutes. So would it make more sense to be speedy? Well, whales aren't, you know, if, if you've ever taken the time to watch killer whales feed on other whales. The whales really, they just got to try to outrun them and, and, and have the stamina because, and they're just, they're floating meat lockers. They're getting chunks ripped out of them. They're, they're it's, it's really sad because they, they you're going to try and fight. It's like fighting a wolf when you're a moose to your wolf coyote. The wolves come in and they work together really nicely and the killer whales do the same. It, it's, they are truly the kings of the sea. They've all, you know, since they showed up, they're smart and they're, I love how they can go and splash the water and flip the seals off of the icebergs by creating those w waves. I mean, the things they do, I'm like, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that. Good yeah. on you. So the, the whole controversy there is, thankfully, in this case, it's more of a body shape, which mm -hmm. alters the weight and length somewhat. But they still acknowledge that the thing is big, it's long, it's heavy. And that's really what everybody wants to hear when they think of the Meg. Mm -hmm. It's something yeah. that can bite through a submarine. That's awesome. And no, they're not alive today if anyone thinks they are. <laughs> I love Public that. service announcement. Yeah, I, that's, I appreciate it. I definitely absolutely agree on that one. Uh, honestly, I think this is a great place to wrap this up i know we had some other things we wanted to talk about but that just unfortunately means we have to have you guys on again uh especially after uh after may to talk about all the fun things that you guys got to do and so i can live vicariously through you and be absolutely jealous um you know and you know maybe kevin will have some other like great scientology like i was gonna say scientology oh my gosh uh scientific uh yeah right judge me over here uh, scientific <laughs> notes 
that he can bring to the table. Uh, Cause obviously I can't over here with my, you know, fancy words. Uh, but gentlemen, where can the good people out in nerd nation and all across the world find you guys? I'll go first. You can find uh, me and all our trips on dinosaurtrips.com. See the destinations we're looking at, but uh, we also, you know, we do tailor made too. So if you've got a spot you want to go uh, in the world and want us to put together a program for you, it won't be, we, you won't necessarily have Dr. Curtis on the trip with you. Although for the right price, we probably could, <laughs> but uh, you know, we can put together tailor mates as well. If people just want us to, to use our, our knowledge of what's out there to, to put something together for them. But yeah, dinosaurtrips.com, the easiest place to find everything that uh, myself and dinosaur trips is up to. Awesome. Uh, Nano Tyrannus skull we CT scanned. Here's a break in it. That's his brain case. Just a little, little cool teaser. Um, I, I'm at fossilcrates.com. I mean, I'm a researcher out of the Arizona Museum of Natural History. And uh, you can see you've got a bunch of publications coming out. You'll find me there. But if you need to get a hold of me or want to just chat, you can also find us. We're rebranding. Our old paleo portals has become Fossil Crates Live. And Fossil Crates Live is where I hold twice a month Zoom discussions, high noon in Arizona time, because our clocks don't change, so I can remember what time it is at all times. And it's on a sat and twice a month on a Saturdays. And I bring in paleontological guests to talk about the latest research. Um, our next guest coming up is Matt Bonham, who does cool arm work. We've got someone named uh, Mariah Howell, who does fistulated cows and dumps uh, Paleozoic plants or, or Mesozoic plants into cow stomachs and then checks the defecation to see how much is left. Really mind blowing, cool stuff. I never, I didn't know they made cows with holes in them. They cut a hole in the side of the cow, and this is a whole science. We so, had a we had an experimental farm next to my high school. They would take us and show us the cows with the holes cut into them. Yeah, that was my Steve. That's how I looked when I was in the, I was in the front row. I, I'm, I'm glad we're doing video with this because <laughs> I, as someone who lived near cows and pigs in Virginia, I did not know that was a thing. Huh. Like I, I just found out like last year they did the whole corking thing to get them from bloat. Like that blew like I didn't know there were so many different magical ways to use cows. And the research is mind-blowingly awesome because of her findings. Because when you study coprolites, you cut them up and you look at the insides of them. Well, she got to thinking, well, no one studies. It's done by agriculture science to control diet and you know, all of the cow stuff they need to make good cow production. But she's using them now to see what would happen to what do stomach juices do to horse tails? And uh, the and all of the plants that she got from Australia and New Zealand, like the well witchy is and all the old plants that were around then, what comes out the other end? Because would we ever find them? It's really, really groundbreaking research. And so she's a guest on Paleo Portal soon. And oh, Darla Zelotnitsky, the second author on the mammal paper where the mammal killed the Cetacosaurus. Uh, she's going to be a guest and Jordan, the first author is also a guest the next few weeks. So if you're looking to hang out and talk paleontologists, uh, I actually am mostly quiet. They tell the stories and then everybody can raise their hands and jump on and talk to them. So it's a wonderful time. Uh, either way, it is a, a delight and fossilcrates.com. Thanks for Kevin uh, for, for uh, being a, a purchaser of our products it's very speaking kind. of which fossil crate speed round this is for all three of you oh brian you have a two second delay because you may have made some of these yourself all right, all right. what do we got here uh, allosaurus claw wrong t-rex claw t-rex claw next t-rex tooth yeah you got it hey it's a, it's a shed maxilla tooth right side half a point for brian <laughs> that go i i'm not this is he's the paleo expert <laughs> show me show, hand show, show me other what? things which hand which hand brian <laughs> uh, i believe that's a right he excavated that one himself <laughs> notice the root on the light brown that's a spinosaurus tooth how much more root it has versus the other one that has a little root the t-rex teeth are just massive he's good the he brown and dark brown way different all right, last one. You mentioned this name earlier, Brian. Related to the Nanosaurus. Pardon? Related to the Nanosaurus. Um, is that Thessalosaurus? No. 
Oh man, I failed. Is that T Rex? The, no. Oh. Zach, make us look good. Well, I guess. <laughs> All right, Gorgosaurus libratus. Oh, yeah, that's the house claw. That <laughs> yeah, so that's the claw on the back, like the dew claw of a dog that sits on the back of the foot and hangs out on the back. Oh, I should have held it this way. There we go. Uh... <laughs> All right, museum quality replicas, everyone, fossilcrates.com. Absolutely. For our viewers, we're putting these on YouTube. So uh, check that out. You can see some DNA cool stuff. DNA pod. Don't forget to the people watching this, the code that they can use to get a free Velociraptor claw if they type in DNA pod. When they go check out in the little box at the bottom left, just put it in there and we'll see it. You won't see it on your end once you type it, but I will on my end and we'll put in a free Velociraptor claw. Awesome. You know what? Dinosaur nice. Trips, mention that you heard about the trips on DNA Pod, 250 bucks off your first booking. Hey! There we there go. We That's go. called networking, everyone. There we go. <laughs> Man. And Kevin, Steve, if you guys are ever in Arizona, please shoot me a text. I'll give you the grand tour of the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Or if you end up in Denver, uh, go to Woodland Park, and I'll get you the grand tour of the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Resource Center. That I feel like we get, we're going to be making some field trips. We got to. We have we'll do, to. We'll now. do a vod oh, for the we podcast. Totally should. I totally should. All right, let me go wrap this up on our side. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's wrap this up. As always, please like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you're listening to podcasts. And if you are listening to us on Apple, Spotify, or watching us on YouTube, please remember to rate and review. We're also on Instagram and Facebook, so please like and follow us at DNA Pod or on our webpage, nerddnapod.com. I'm your host, Steve Pugh. I have been joined by with the 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 I see, I'm trying to come up with something witty for you here about clever thinking and just like able to come up with analogies. Uh obviously I'm I'm <laughs> sucking honorary here. scientist. Yeah, Kevin. honorary scientist. I like Thank that. You. Let's go with that one. The honorary scientist, Kevin Sibobbins, as well as Zach from dinosaurtrips.com, and as always, Dr. Brian Curtis, our go-to paleontologist. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Thank you so much for just Letting us delve into everything that is nerdy and dinosaur -y and all the fun things you guys have coming for us. Like, seriously, nothing but love for you guys. Seriously, ladies and gentlemen, go check these guys out. Go have these fun trips that I, I want to go on and go buy tons of these little museum quality replicas because I have them. I love them. Kevin has them. They're, they're just fun to have and they're great. You know what actually I use them for? I use them for D&D. &D. I use the replicas all the time for D&D. &D. So, like, they are great props. So, DMs out there, another sales pitch for you. But <laughs> let's wrap this up. Seriously, guys, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Anytime, Eves Amigos. Anytime. Thank, thank you so you much time. for having us. Appreciate it. Yep. Adios. Thank you and good night. <laughs>